The ancestors of the SUV were developed for practical purposes. The Jeep and Humvee originated as military vehicles, while Land Rovers were originally marketed towards British farmers working in muddy fields. But over the last 40 years, SUV sales have boomed far beyond this minor demand, rising from virtually no sales half a century ago to 35% of all US car sales in 2012 and 43% by 2017. It's clear that today the vast majority of SUVs are ending up in a suburban garage, or increasingly, stuck outside of one. This trend is dangerous, leading to booming carbon emissions and a pedestrian safety crisis. But its causes are even more sinister. Your typical suburban SUV owner generally gives two explanations for their love of SUVs. Holds nine with available seating. Then two, it's a super cargo handler. Either I want to be able to carry more stuff, or I want to be safer on the road. It doesn't just keep its occupants safe, it helps keep everyone safe. That is to say, a desire for space and safety. Yet neither of these explanations holds up to scrutiny. Storage space can't be the reason. A 2005 study, which compared storage space among the top-selling SUV, station wagon, and minivan in 2000, found that the SUV had the same volume of cargo space as the station wagon, and barely half the cargo space of the minivan. The same is true today. 2019's top-selling crossovers, the Toyota RAV4 and the Honda CR-V, have a maximum storage space of 1.97 and 2.15 cubic meters, respectively, while the top-selling SUVs, the Dodge Journey and the Jeep Grand Cherokee, have 1.91 and 1.93 cubic meters of maximum storage space, respectively. Clearly, space is not the issue here. Nor is it safety. That 2005 study also notes that SUVs are more prone to rollover and brake failure even compared to bulky minivans. While a 2004 report by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration concludes that SUV drivers are 11% more likely to die in a traffic accident than those in ordinary cars. This is not to mention the severe risk SUV drivers pose to smaller cars, bicyclists, and pedestrians, but that's another matter. The point is, there's no clear evidence that SUVs are safer for those inside them. Now, we could jump to folksy explanations. Americans are gluttons for big stuff in general, or buy massive SUVs to compensate for something else. I don't find these sufficient, being too vague or too shallow by themselves. But Dr. Josh Lauer, professor at the University of New Hampshire, makes a compelling argument in a 2005 paper, which we'll spend the rest of this video discussing. According to this short but incredibly insightful paper, the demand for SUVs does indeed stem from a demand for safety and space, just in a different way than many owners are willing to admit. As all of you know, crime today is an American epidemic. From the late 70s through the 90s, Americans developed what can mildly be described as a paranoid fixation on crime. While crime did see a steady increase early on in this period, public paranoia about it quickly blew way out of proportion. Crime began to decline dramatically in the 90s, yet by 1994, over half of Americans claimed that crime was the most important problem facing the United States in one national survey. As reported in a 2003 study which specifically highlights that this big scare was quote, more of a network TV news scare than a scare based upon the real world of crime, unquote. That study concluded that news media was four times as influential on public perception of crime than actual crime rates. American media fixation on crime is still apparent today. 14 of 2018's 40 most watched TV shows were crime or courtroom procedurals. It's difficult to overstate just how freaked out people were about crime in this period, especially as quote, 
crime spilled beyond its acceptable inner-city limits and into previously safe suburban neighborhoods, unquote, creating a pervasive terror of crime in white and suburban society. Can we honestly say that America is a land with justice for all if we do not now exert every effort to eliminate this confederation of professional criminals, this dark evil enemy within? The response was just as harsh. This was the era of the war on drugs, draconian minimum sentences, and mass incarceration. Additionally, the home security market grew by over 30% annually in the early 80s, alongside the introduction of mace and pepper spray as crime deterrents for civilians. The first modern gated communities were built in this period as well, a phenomenon Lauer claims, quote, was largely a response to a growing fear of crime, unquote citing a 1997 study. The sales of SUVs also boomed in this period for the first time. Cars with four-wheel drive, high ground clearance, and enclosed rear passenger or cargo space, all built on the underbody of a pickup truck, saw sales double between 1983 and 1984 alone, and have steadily risen ever since. Lauer puts his thesis plainly, quote, the rise of the SUV can be placed within the context of American fear of crime during the 1970s and early 1980s and, more generally, within the context of heightened risk consciousness in an emerging culture of fear." Unquote. He cites a French anthropologist and advertising consultant, Clotaire Rapai, who stated that people buy SUVs primarily, quote, because they are trying to look as menacing as possible to allay their fears of crime and other violence." Unquote. Car advertising executives have clearly taken this lesson to heart. Lauer cites a 1989 Range Rover review which describes the vehicle as, quote, a luxury tank, a metro war wagon, unquote, while a 1995 review of the Jeep Cherokee Sport lays it out plainly, quote, I know why many Americans own guns. It's the same reason they own four-wheel drive sport utility vehicles." Unquote. SUVs provide an overwhelming feeling of safety in response to an overwhelming terror of crime and violence. Lauer points out that SUV sales started rising just as car hijackings began to gain prominence in national crime reporting, generating even more demand for fortress cars. This isn't an artifact of the 20th century either. In a recent article about The Villages, a wealthy and conservative retirement community in central Florida with a population exceeding 100,000 people, the author interviews two residents who, quote, carry 380 Berettas when they leave the villages in case they encounter hijackers, unquote. This is not an isolated sentiment. Every year, Gallup polling asks Americans if they think crime in the U.S. is increasing or not. In every national survey since 2002, a majority and often supermajority of Americans are certain that crime is increasing, even though statistically, it has been almost uniformly dropping for the entire period. Only the target of the terror has changed. Where white suburbanites once feared black criminals from inner cities, Today's retirees are terrified of Latino immigrants. To quote those two residents, quote, Damn right it's dangerous out there. We need the wall because a lot of them are rapists and killers, unquote. A sentiment shared by a large proportion of the American population. MS-13 has replaced super predators, but the overall narrative is unchanged. Lauer notes that vigilante fantasies began to dominate popular culture around the same time. In this case, the SUV becomes a Batmobile, allowing its owners to take the chaos of the urban jungle into their own hands. But it's more complicated than that. Two other trends also emerged in the early 80s. Reaganite tax cuts and neoliberal reforms, combined with austerity in social services funding, caused income inequality to skyrocket while generating an ideology of personal responsibility, something we've discussed here before. The latter is especially critical. Increasing suburbanization, rising gun sales, the home security market boom, 
and the growth in SUV popularity all composed what one researcher termed, quote, the individualization of social risk, unquote. In response to collective problems, Americans are looking for individual solutions. Trying to escape from crises or fortify themselves off from them, rather than seeking collective solutions or addressing the root problem. The 80s saw the rise of a sort of fatalism about society, which the SUV represents in a very real and material way. In practical terms, Lauer points out that the safety of the SUV is less about avoiding car accidents and more about surviving them, often at the expense of other drivers. But this is true for broader social problems as well, such as climate change. SUVs have notoriously terrible fuel economy in a time when most people are aware of the dangers of greenhouse gases. Buying an SUV therefore represents a fatalism about global warming. There's nothing we can do to stop it, so might as well burn all the gasoline we want and get the biggest, baddest war wagon for the inevitable Mad Max world we're all headed towards. Keeping you comfortably in command. We can't avoid the crisis. We can only survive it. It's no coincidence that the original Mad Max, which centers around post-apocalyptic warriors duking it out in heavily armored cars, was released in 1979. In this case, the SUV is less Batmobile and more like Immortan Joe's Giga Horse, preparing the owner for the life of a warlord in the anarchic wastes of a future America. As income inequality and class divisions have exploded since the 70s, it has led to increased social stratification and separation between rich and poor. America's fastest growing grocery chains today are Whole Foods on one hand, and Dollar Tree and Aldi on the other, stores which serve the two extremes of the socioeconomic spectrum. Private schools charging tens of thousands of dollars a year grow in popularity as public ones become dilapidated. The wealthy live either in urban towers with dormant and sophisticated security systems, or isolated and homogenous gated communities. In fact, the Villages, that mother of all gated communities in Florida, was first developed in the 1980s. Rapai, that French anthropologist we mentioned earlier, observed this himself. Quote, The United States is in some ways becoming a medieval society in which people live and work in the modern equivalent of castles and try to shield themselves while traveling between them. They do this by riding in sport utility vehicles, which look armored, and by trying to appear as intimidating as possible." Unquote. The sheer bulk of SUVs has an added advantage in a society increasingly defined by steep class divisions. Lauer quotes Howard Koch, a wealthy movie producer, about why he likes SUVs. Quote, I sit on top of the crowd and look down, unquote. This spatial domination, in addition to declaring the owner's higher, I mean literally higher position in society, has a disastrous downside. The height limits the visibility of the people below compared to traditional cars, leading to a recent spike in pedestrian deaths. It helps that SUVs are significantly more expensive than sedans and other cars. While their terrible fuel economy makes running them all the more costly, securing their position as a status good. Finally, Lauer comments on those ubiquitous commercials of SUVs cruising through desolate, remote landscapes. In a world gone mad, the SUV represents the ability to get away from others to escape to a remote landscape and experience happy, individualistic isolation, far from the problems of society. It also plays into the pastoral pretensions of America's elite, something laid bare in the popular press. A 1988 Newsweek article proclaims that, quote, the Range Rover now reigns as essential equipment for every would-be American squire, unquote. Yet, this is just another case of the individualization of social risk. Why bother confronting, and maybe fixing, society's problems if you can just hop in your SUV and escape those problems instead? This is the appeal of the SUV to America's increasingly wealthy and isolated elite. <laughs>
as described by one researcher Lauer cites, quote, as the distance, physical and financial, between rich and poor grows, so does the appeal of the SUV. Chevy Suburbans and Ford Expeditions amply protect their occupants from the outside world while holding the allure of vacations in beautiful and remote places where lesser cars cannot tread." Unquote. Lauer ultimately concludes that the SUV satisfies a demand for what he calls, quote, euphemistic safety and euphemistic space, unquote. A desire for safety and space from a society perceived as undergoing a gradual collapse. For some, this arises from a paranoid fear of crime and violence, a phenomenon the government is apparently unwilling or unable to control and so something the individual has to take into their own hands, hence euphemistic safety. For others, the SUV is a component of the devolution of America into a stratified, unequal society dominated by a de facto aristocracy. A state of affairs even self-proclaimed neoliberal publications have admitted exists. Today's elite are increasingly withdrawing from public life, isolating themselves socially, and in many cases, literally fortifying themselves. Hence, euphemistic space. SUVs are fundamentally a technological solution to a social problem. In response to social crises, they provide an individual feeling of safety and satisfy an individual demand for space. They represent withdrawal from society, isolation and fortification, rather than engagement with others, the collapse of the social contract and the end of any hope of working together to solve our problems. It's a depressing, cynical, paranoid, and antisocial worldview, one which Rapai himself described as quote, irrational and reptilian, unquote. But we need to understand why it's come to dominate if we are to ever imagine a better world instead.